I should start and say um, I'm not a museum archaeologist. I'm a failed museum archaeologist. <laughs> I worked in museums, archaeology museums in Spain. I actually did an MA in uh, museum studies. And I came back to England, spent a year trying to get a job, and ended up in English heritage, now historic England. So I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it's definitely not museum archaeology. Um, I'm also, I should point out a bit of background, I'm also a trustee at the Wiltshire Archaeology and Natural History Society, so that's uh, the Wiltshire Museum, and I'm very proud that I am the youngest trustee. <laughs> and I'm now getting to that age where I'm not always the youngest, so that's quite good. We yeah, that pride. <laughs> so what do I do? Um, I'm in the capacity building team at Historic England. Uh, we deal with developing guidance, research resources, which is what I do. Uh, better access to information, that is the historic, no, historic inf heritage information access strategy. Uh, I think you're on that as well, aren't you, Gail? Um, and we look at training, so it's a whole sort of, a whole package of support, and it's all externally faced. So it's not internal, it's all external. Uh, and so my specific role is I've developed research frameworks, uh, which we took a little bit had a, about yesterday, and I was really interested in seeing the Yorkshire Museum had their own research framework for the Roman collection, which was really interesting. Um, I'm going to talk today about reference resources. So this is all about typologies, reference collections, identification guides. These are not research collections. This is the reference collections. This is a slight, a slight distinction. Um, what we're talking about is how we're improving access to these. And it's also how the whole part of a package is supporting in terms of training uh, and looking at developing standards, uh, which again I'll speak about in a sec. So why? Um, I think I've lost the bottom of that slide, but never mind. <coughs> the main focus for me and Historic England and my role is supporting the planning system. So this is a very specific support. Um, so these are the, trying to develop the resources, the tools, the training, the guidance, which will support people improving their working potential and for in, within the framework of the planning system. That doesn't mean it's just the planning framework system, if that's just the focus for that. And the big thing is, is the maximum value, the research value coming out of the planning system. So that's why, you know, the excavations, investigations, the stuff that comes out is trying to improve the knowledge that comes from that and also the guidance and knowledge that goes back into the system in terms of how people make decisions of what to do. So that's where the sort of the, where the, um, uh, the focus is. Um, I did a, a strategy, I think it's about six years ago now, it's gone a bit quick, that set it all out and this is, so I've been working through the last four or five years, a set of steps. So it's not just me making it all up as I go along. It is actually a proper strategic and planned thing, which is quite incredible. Um, so one of the aspects which I won't talk about is the research frameworks. Uh, and in fact, Doug shouldn't really be here today recording you. He should be doing my digital platform that links up the research frameworks. Yeah. When I got an email from him the other day saying, I'm just in London, I said, oh yeah, right. I wonder where you are. <laughs> You can cut that bit, Doug. <laughs> um, and then the other bit is, is looking at the reference resources. And the idea is we're trying to, we, we get a lot of projects coming in and saying, can you fund this? And we need to try and see how we can prioritise our funding, how we can, we've got an ever decreasing pot of money, but there's an ever increasing amount of work that can be done. And we need to try and look at how we can do that. So I'm going to look at this. So this is the archaeological reference resources. This is what I'm saying. These are the typologies and idea. So it's these things that finding out when we, we established a project uh, a few years ago to get a better idea of what reference resources being used, then looking at the gaps and the priorities, looking also about any of these collections are at risk, which we'll talk about later, and then just funding a, a funding prioritization system. Unfortunately, um, the, well, the project was undertaken by Hal Dalwood and Rachel Edwards, and unfortunately a couple of years ago Hal died. So, um, very, very sad. Um, so we actually closed the project, and then Rachel actually closed the project. And so we're sort of uh, in, a, in a slight pause because we wanted to use the results of that to inform the next stage of the work. So we've gone on to two strands. 
One is that I'm taken under a much reduced review of reference resources. And the other part is that we actually sort of moved into actually having a funding stream for improving access to reference resources, which I'll just uh, talk about now. So we put out a call for proposals. So improving access, this was looking at how can we, any of these reference resources, typologies, the reference collections, the ones that exist, how can we improve access to them? And so we had a certain amount of money, asked for the proposal that came in, and we funded three initially and then a fourth project. So the first one, just to say, is the, this is the Worcestershire Ceramics Online Database. So this is the Worcestershire uh, type series that they had online, but they updated it. They put the forms on, and they put uh, more of the post-medieval and modern collections online. So this is just an example of one of those. The next one is the, right, let me, the National Zoo Archaeological Reference Resource, NZRR. Um, this is a slightly different pr approach. This is a, an interesting project run by the University of York, which is basically identifying all the collections, museum collections, university collections, which have animal bones and collections in them, and basically having like a gazetteer. So if you're researching a type of horse or beaver or something like that, you'd be able to search for it and find out which collection has that uh, skeletal uh, remains. So that's a really sort of a, a slightly higher level um, resource, but also really, really useful. And a really nice model which starts off that, and actually we could probably reuse that for other types of things. Um, my favourite, the National Pipe Archive. I spent, a, I supposed to go for an hour and I spent a day, did have a little look around the archive, it is brilliant. Um, uh, Susie and David are fantastic, and so a lot of the stuff they had, a lot of the records, really, really incredible collection, but they actually, as part of the project, we funded them to um, help us part of the students at Liverpool University to actually learn how to scan and digitise and they put these things online. So there's a large amount of stuff that's back online now or is online now. The glossaries, the digital resources, county list, which is a fantastic resource. This seed funding that we gave them allowed them to look for other things <coughs> and they've actually recently just found out they've got funding from another source, which is fantastic, so it means it's not us, uh, for I think it's a day or a couple of days a, uh, a week for a few years. So that's really, really useful. So our funding can actually help contribute to that. Um, this is the fourth one that is not finished. All the others are finished. This is the oh, mineralized plant and invertebrate. I'll move on. It is really good. <laughs> I'm just still a bit confused. Apparently, you find a lot of this in cesspits. Does anyone know about this? Yeah. I'm all right. <laughs> um, those were all very successful. Uh, successful because those discrete projects managed to, to run really well. Uh, and we found out last week that we've actually got funding for another call for proposals. And that call for proposals went out yesterday. So I've got the link in, but maybe I can send that around. We can do that. I'll tweet it and everything else. So again, we're looking for more proposals discrete projects, again, to update and make publicly available these reference resources. So if you are interested or you have any ideas, get in contact, but have a look at the call for proposals. It's not creating new reference resources, it's ones that already exist, updating them and making them more accessible. Uh, I've, I've just put this one, this is, I love the project tile, safe card. <laughs> this is project safe card, it's really, really good. Uh, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not as exciting as it sounds. But this is the, um, the Terra Sigillata stamp card index. I'm sure there's people here who know about that. Um, that is, the cards are being digitised, there's a great big, there's a main Samian database and it's adding extra information onto it. Uh, I will, again, we'll highlight this one, we'll send some links out. So it's a, a small project, but very, very useful. What they do need to look at is actually safeguarding the collection of the cards themselves. So we looked at that, I think people talked about it yesterday, with some really lovely sort of annotated index cards that actually are a, a collection in itself. Um, a type series for Anglo-Saxon and medieval pottery of Norfolk and Suffolk that Duncan is leading on for Historic England. So we have funded one... Uh, a new type series for pottery, which I'll talk about the whole sort of where we're going with all this in a minute. 
Uh, another one, a creation of additional archive resource for the man set to hearts or Roman pottery kilns. Again, that Duncan is leading on. You do? Hmm? And Jenny. <laughs> and Jenny at the back is a PAO on that one. Um, we talked about research from its tiny bit yesterday. This has been flagged up as a priority in the Roman uh, study group for Roman Pottery's research framework and in the, in, in the regional research frameworks. So this shows that by having those frameworks in place can prioritise projects and it can be done. This has been a long time coming but it's a, it'll be a very interesting project. Uh, that's been undertaken by Worcestershire Archaeology and Archive Services. Um, we, all, oh, we also helped bring back the National Roman Fabric <coughs> Reference Collection online. It got lost for a number of years, and so we had quite a few discussions, and it's back online. A very, very important reference a collection, really, really useful, back on there. And we actually looked at creating, uh, we actually had a training day there, or it's a taster session, for um, early years Roman pottery special. So this was hosted at the BM's other building, which I managed to find, um, which was really useful and really interesting because this brings in this whole thing about opening up these collections for use. And again, I'll talk about that in a second. But this is probably the first time that people have actively looked at it since they actually created the, the handbook back in sort of late 90s, which is quite shocking as it's a national reference collection in a national museum. But I think this just shows some of the issues we've got with, the, with all the pottery type things. So where I'm now is review of the reference resources. I've started off on the easy one, pottery type series. It's only a little bit of work. Uh, and then I'll go and look at the rest of the object in Ecofax. Yeah, as well as do all the research frameworks and, and see what else they give me to do. So review of ceramic type series. How am I doing for time? Yeah. <coughs> oh, I can slow down. Oh, I'll take it easier then. <laughs> um, I'm not a ceramic or pottery specialist, but I know a few people who are, and I know one specific person in historic England. So Duncan is my mentor on pottery. So the idea is, again, looking at these are the, the types of reference collections. So what we wanted to do is improve our understanding of the present condition of how these are. This can be the whole the whole gamut of across the content, the coverage, but also really important, the condition. You know, where are these pottery type series? Um, who is hosting them? Um, are they being used? Does anyone have, actually have access to them? This is a really important area. A lot of these were sort of created sort of late 70s, 80s, but they've still been created and we're funding one at the moment. They're still really, really essential. But over the last sort of 10, 15 years, it's, there's just got caught up in this, the whole change we see across the sector. And especially in the last few years, I think, when we're looking at the um, decrease in archaeological expertise in museums. Um, so it's something that's really, really important. That's why we wanted to focus on the pottery type series set specifically, rather than just being part of that overall general review. Um, and the result of it, we want to set out a strategic plan. We actually want to try and see how we can actually improve the situation and have that positive action. So the survey questionnaires were to type series owners. This was taken from the Medieval Pottery Research Group's list of type series that includes the Roman and the prehistoric ones. Quite difficult because all the, uh, quite a few of the contact details were very, very wrong, out of date, huge amounts of changes. So even at the initial, uh, at the outset of the project, trying to find out who was hosting these or who actually had the type series was really, really difficult. Not just names change, you had organisation change and everything like that. But it was also looking at uh, telephone interviews with you know, people who were involved in the whole sector. And we also looked at a regional Algeo survey. And this survey was looking about, in their briefs, which local authority development control officers are actually saying in the brief, you, we want you to use the Worcestershire, the Bedfordshire, Greater London uh, type series. So this is a really important aspect of it to find it from the, uh, from the development control side of things. So this is all the stuff we want to look at and this is the questionnaire and I've got this great big spreadsheet of stuff that we will be publishing which will be useful because it gives actually really interesting background to the collections and how they developed but also looks in terms of the quantities and the documentation and it really does 
show a real sort of palimpsest of, of differences and, and how this how all these type series have evolved because they really have evolved very much from individual researchers in their own areas of research in their own ways and, and it's a very very interesting way of how you see it's all developed and evolved um, they are very different so the main findings I mean they're not very I mean most people here who know anything about this will probably go yeah we know all that because it's absolutely it's just the way it is but they're very different there are gaps gaps some people have the I don't know, Roman reference type series for a county, but nothing, no medieval, there might be the opposite. Uh, there's gaps in coverage in terms of across the country. Uh, the hosting curation arrangements are very, very different, really interesting. I'll mention that later. Um, approach, the way they're documented, the way they are doing, there are lumpers and splitters, there are ways, the whole approach is different. There is a a set way of doing things in many ways, but it's still the approach are different. Um, many of them out of date, a lot of them haven't been looked at since the 1980s, certainly haven't been added to in a consistent manner, and some are at risk. Um, Historic England, we have our heritage at risk list for sites and monuments. It'd be really interesting to sort of create something of, you know, type series at risk or collections at risk. I think that's something that we actually should be focusing on. These are heritage assets just like sites and monuments. So actually it would be interesting to have to see if we could do that. I'm not sure politically it would be useful because Heritage at Risk is a brand, Heritage at Risk is a brand, but it would be very interesting. I think we really do need to think about this a lot more. And that is a way of, I think, prioritizing work being done on it and getting funding to do things. Um, that's not too bad. I've got a sort of, this is a rough map. It's not complete. This is my red, gold, and green. Gold is the best. So that's nice. Got quite a nice group. I'll call a few out. Leicestershire's not bad. In fact, very good. Uh, Museum of London, uh, Worcestershire, uh, Gloucester is being d um, dated at the moment. So this is sort of physical type series that are being actually actively curated and updated. Plus, they might have some sort of online presence. So it's that sort of mixture. The green ones aren't bad, pretty good. Some of the red ones are not very good. Um, again, mostly to do with lack of access, lack of documentation, things like that. And the, the sort of, what's that, lines over there are, no one got back to me. This is information not received. There may be a couple of people in this room who forgot to send me emails again. Um, Main findings, again, the second one, uh, really, really limited use of physical type series. Um, the only people who use them are the people who host them. And this tends to be only those that are hosted by um, contracting archaeological units. So they are very much in-house type series. It is a difficult one, and I'll mention together, where that in-house blends into actually becoming a county series or not but the ones that are being actually used are by those people. Um, there are use of online type series. The Worcestershire has been used very well, very good. Um, but there is a limited access to some of these things and that, that is a real problem. One of the biggest ones, again, we're finding more and more is a lack of expert curation in museums. Uh, a, a example off the top of my head, Gloucester. Gloucester City Museum, they get put in online. Um, the, the people there, development control and in, in Gloucester, the uh, town development control are saying, we want this type of series to be used, but there's no one at the museum to actually curate it. We need someone else to do it. So that we need to think about how we can, who could do that. Could it possibly be, say, for example, Cotswold Archaeology or another contractor unit who have the expertise? So we need to think about how we can have those that models there is hypothetical access. Nearly every single type series said, yes, we are open for business, that we come along. But again, most of them, or the ones who are uh, hosted by contracting uh, commercial archaeological units, it, it's that we don't advertise it. It's only, you know, it's, it's, a, it's still that sort of, they're not like public access like a museum hosted collection is. So I think that's, again, something we need to look at. 
and there is a lack of publishing the type series codes and concordance tables. They do exist, but no one actually puts them online. They will send them by request. So it's quite tricky. But positive, there are some good ones, updated and used. There is quite a lot of work being done. Uh, I know in, in, for example, in Somerset, uh, the Somerset David Dawson is doing updating the type series there. And that's going to be on public display at the Heritage Centre. So that's really positive. There are some requirements by local authority donor control. Worcestershire, Warwickshire, Leicestershire, for example, some others are saying you should use it. So it's that push to being used, in, um, which is really important. And then again, some like the Roman, the National Roman Fabric Collection, it's embedded in the culture of Roman pottery. It's just, it's already there, which is fantastic. But we need to think about embedding the, lo the use of local reference uh, type series and the codes in different ways of doing it. So I've got a report coming out, it's been coming out for a while, but unfortunately at Historic England we have lots of other stuff and pressures and, and people tell you have to do something, you have to do it <coughs> first. Um, we, the recommendations will be out as part of the report, I'm hoping this side of Christmas. Um, I've been saying that for a while, Duncan, haven't I? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, we need a nationally coordinated programme. We can't, we can't just keep doing this nationally. We need, to, we need to think it more strategically. We can't just be doing like sort of little bits here, little bits there. We need to think about it much, much more coordinated. We need to promote the value and use, specifically the visits to the technicians. We need to think about the financial models, commercial contractors. They don't have the funding to go over and visit something. We need to change that. We need to say, come on, as part of your work, if there's a significant... Um, collection of pottery from an excavation, they really need to think about having that in the budget to go and do it and do it properly. Um, really important, we need to think about safeguarding physical and online collections. Online, again, you know, the, the websites go off, um, run out, they need to be updated, financed. Physical collections, we really do need to think about this. Uh, we need to think about it from a museum perspective because they should be safe there. But because of the lack of curatorial expertise, they're being redundant to become moribund. So that's actually really has a real issue. We need to think about actually what about some of these um, uh, these seri these type series that are hosted by commercial contractors. They are probably in a better condition because they are being updated and used. But what happens to them, and who actually we need to think about the ownership. You know, should there be some sort of uh, relationship with the local county museum or whatever museum there is so they could be safeguarded in the future we need to think about those sort of ways of doing it um, updating them um, even the contractors who host these things still don't have a formal way of updating type series because they don't seem to be able to work it out in, in terms of individual excavations from that way so when they update them it tends to be ad hoc and unofficial we need to think about, you know, can we get funding through the developers and through ways to actually think about doing this properly and build that into it as part of, I don't know, the archiving process or something like that. It need, we need to think about it. Um, support, training and type series, really, really important. That early years one at the Roman Fabric Collection was fantastic. It was really, really good, very positive. A lot of people haven't actually had a chance to work on these things, to actually have to look at it. These are not training collections per se, and I'm not saying that, but I think it's in terms of the use of the type series and how they can be benefited and how they can be used is something we need to think about um, and we need to promote that as well. Um, this thing I'm going to very quickly finish off with, thank you, is we need a consistent approach to creation of type series. We need some standards. We are creating these because we want to be able to link these type series together. We want to be able to think about it from that more national perspective only in terms of the coordination, how they all link together. We're getting too many isolated type series that really should be sort of interconnected. Um, the last couple of slides here. We are doing some work at the moment. There was workshops with three pottery specialist groups that are looking at this and coming together to create a standard for developing type series. And they were coming together to basically to decide on what information they need to record to create a type series and agree things like terminologies. So this could be the, the form types and things like that. That's a really, really big step. 
all agreed by those three groups, and now they're just with colleagues at Historic England to put them into a sort of a, a proper standard that will go through to the Forum for Information Standards and Heritage to be signed off. Very, very important um, uh, move forward. And then we're looking at, from that <coughs> aspect, is creating a template for online and a template to be able to create these things online. It could be using the Worcestershire system that's good, or there's another database, the Arches system, we're looking at. So again, this, this will be able to roll out standard type series, which will be really important. And that is it for this, apart from two very quick mentions. Not to do the talk, but very quickly. One, we've got a project out. I'm sure lots of people have heard about this already. This is the Digital Archive and Archaeology Project, looking at how to manage digital archaeology in the project environment before it's archived. If you haven't heard about it, come and talk to Duncan <laughs> or Claire. Uh, but really important, that's just a flag up. And um, lastly, I'm co-hosting a session at CIFA with Mike Novell uh, on community engagement um, at the Leeds uh, conference. We're looking for examples from across the sector, but one of the reasons this has came up and flagged for me in, in living and working Wiltshire in an association museum is the lack of <coughs> connection, the lack of in, in, input from museums at the development, at the commercial side of things before the development. So it would be interesting to see whether there is any examples, good or bad, if anyone here knows about museums being involved in the whole process from the excavation and not just being the end product, receiving the archives and then having to deal with the 5,000 extra people coming in who have kind of reconnect with the heritage. So things like that would be useful. So if anyone has any ideas, please come and talk to me. That's it. Thank you very much.